All right. Let's, let's open the Genesis chapter 9, and I'm just going to finish up a few things here that we left off three weeks ago or four, whatever it's been now. You know, when we come to Genesis chapter 9, we're on the other side of the flood. The one-year-long flood is over, global flood. God establishes a new beginning. In fact, Genesis 9 verses 1 and 2 sound like Genesis chapter 1 Verse 26 and 28, be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth, rule it, because it's a new beginning. Exactly what God said to Adam, now God is saying to Noah, because his family is the, the, the only people around. So it's a new beginning. Point number two, God puts, puts forth a new command, and that command is in Chapter 9, verse 4 and 5, and then, uh, no, 3 and 4. That's what I should have had. I should have had 1 and 2. 3 and 4, and then 6 and 7. And the new commands, twofold. Meat is now added to man's diet. It says, um, everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. But you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. The pagans used to do that to get, and maybe still do in places, drinking blood and eating blood because they think it gives them life. Because the life, life of the flesh is where? In the blood. So they drink blood and to get more life. It's, it's a, it's a, so uh, you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. And then the second command, respect for human life enforced by capital punishment. This is the dispensation the dispensation of uh, human government. Um, the dispensation of human government, and if we go back here, one, we are, now, we are now at the beginning of that second line. You know, the, the very good world and then the, the world between the fall of man and the flood and then... We have been in that center column, that time frame, ever since the end of the flood. We have been, we're there, the present heavens and earth. And there are things coming in the future, catastrophic things and amazing things that God has revealed in his word. But we are there and we've been there for uh, some 4,500 years. Um, we don't know exactly, but it's not too far off that. But anyway, um, so number three, God makes a covenant with all life on the earth. And look at chapter 9, verse 8. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth, I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be cut off by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God gave a sign. God says, this is the sign of the covenant. I am making between me and you and every living creature with you a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on the earth. Three things about that covenant, A, B, and C. First of all, it is an unconditional covenant. There are no conditions uh, that God put upon mankind or anything. God says, this is my covenant. It, is, it will never happen again. And the sign of it will be the rainbow. 
So that's kind of cool, isn't it? I mean, just think about that. Every time I see a rainbow, I do, I think of this. And it's a great teaching opportunity, parents, with your kids, you know. Um, yeah, a great teaching opportunity. That rainbow takes us back right back to this passage after the flood. And God's promise that he will never bring water to cover the earth again and destroy all flesh. So it's an unconditional covenant. Secondly, it is guaranteed with a sign, okay, the, the rainbow. And then thirdly, this is the first covenant in the Bible. This is the first biblical covenant that is given in the Bible. Of course, we got one coming up real soon, very important one, the Abrahamic covenant. There's the, there's the Noahic, I mean the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, the new covenant. We'll be getting into some of those, but uh, the Abrahamic covenant we're going to spend quite a bit of time on because it really is an important one. It's also an unconditional covenant, no conditions. But it's much more focused to Abraham and his descendants through Isaac and Jacob. But if I keep going, I'll get off on that. Okay. God makes a covenant. All right. Now we come to Genesis chapter 9, verse 18 through 28 or 29. And um, I want to begin this latter part of chapter 9 with this very interesting passage. It's a prophecy. This passage is a prophecy about the relationship between Japheth, Shem, and Ham and their descendants. And you'll see why it is so significant to American life, to American culture and history. And maybe our days right now would be much different if we as a church handle this passage differently. So here we go. And I'm going to begin by quoting from Dr. Tony Evans' book, uh, Let, Let's Get to Know Each Other. He wrote this 20 years ago, maybe longer. Yeah, I think longer in the 90s. Dr. Tony Evans and the subtitle of the book is What White Christians Should Know About Black Christians. And here's, what, here's a quote. One of the most damaging and devastating myths perpetuated throughout American history is the supposed inferiority of black people to white people. I will never forget the constant word pictures painted for me as a child growing up in Baltimore, Maryland, that were designed to instill the inferiority myth within me. There were the White Castle restaurants that made it unmistakably clear that colored people were not good enough to eat there. I still remember my father's words when I asked him to stop at one of those restaurants to buy my brother and me a hamburger. He said, sorry, son, the white folks won't let us eat there. Even today, I grimace a little bit when I drive past a white castle on my way back home to visit my parents. The myth was also reinforced in my childhood by the whites only signs at places of business and the signs that pointed to inferior rear entrances and read colored people enter here. Then there were the white churches that praised God on Sunday as we, as we did, but would not allow my family to worship there. My father would say, son, they believe that God meant for the races to be kept separate, even when it comes to worshiping him. So the question is, where did this myth that black people are inferior to white people come from? Well, let me tell you where it, origi where it really comes from. You know where it comes from? Evolution. Evolution is racist. Let's just get to the point. Evolutionary teaching is racist at its core because not everyone evolved the same way. Some evolved uh, better. You know, I, mean, I got a picture here from a 1925 very, very well-known and used public school textbook in 1925. This is what the young people were being taught. That 
that there are different strains of evolutionary development. Some have developed more, some have developed less, and there are basically four categories of um, de racial development. There's the Australoid, the, the Australian Aborigines. There's the Negroid, the Mongoloid, and the Caucasoid. And that's what they taught. For a whole generation and those afterward in 1925 in the public schools, in the, it's evolution, it's all racist, and that is the root of this stuff. But the problem is Christians believed this stuff and they found a passage of scripture to support it. And that's this one right here. This text has played a significant role, this passage we're coming to, has played a significant role throughout American church history in, in creating, supporting, and perpetuating the myth that black people are inferior to white people. This passage. Um... This passage is the basis for the infamous curse of Ham teaching. How many have ever heard of the curse of Ham teaching? Okay. The curse of Ham teaching. The curse of Ham teaching asserts or teaches that because Ham was the father of black people or the African continent. Let me show you this and we'll, we'll come back to this. But I'm just going to give you the, the upfront version right now. Uh, <clears throat> let me get my pointer here. Yeah. Um, because he and his descendants, they were the father. This is this is Ham had. Uh, in the, in the genealogy, Ham had four sons. One was named Cush. This is the people of the Upper Nile, way up in Upper Nile. Ethiopia, the Sudanese, the Sudan people, the Ethiopians. That's the, that's the Cushites. Then Mitzrayim, which is Egypt. Then Put, which is Libya. And then Canaan, that was his fourth son. And the, and the Canaan, these are the people of the land of Canaan. Remember Joshua went in, they were told to wipe them out. They didn't do it, remember that? But uh, these are the uh, Arvadites, the Zemorites, the Archites, the Sidonians, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Girgashites. Okay, these are the uh, descendants, and they're not, they're, they're, uh, they're a lighter color skin. So, um, so those are the descendants. So the curse of Ham teaching asserts that because Ham was the father of black people, the African continent, the descendants on the African continent, and because he and his descendants were cursed to be slaves because of his sin against his father Noah. Africans and their descendants are destined to be slaves and should submissively accept their inferior status in fulfillment of biblical prophecy. That's the curse of Ham teaching. Now, in the decades prior to the Civil War in this country, white Christians in the South used this passage and the curse of Ham teaching to justify slavery in their minds and to keep slaves in their place. And in the decades after the Civil War, white Christians in the South and the North used, and perhaps in some cases still do today, this passage and the curse of Ham teaching to justify segregation and racial prejudice. And, um, and the, ch the church endorsed the myth and it endorsed the myth 
when it was silent to the immorality of parishioners who bred slaves for profit and for pleasure. The church endorsed the myth when it forced blacks to sit in the rear of churches if they were allowed access at all. And the church endorsed the myth when white denominations established schools for biblical learning that excluded blacks who desired training in God's word. This practice continued well into the second half of the 20th century in evangelical Bible colleges, seminaries, and mission agencies. Um, you know, today the church stands up for right to life, don't we? And we should, right? We believe in life begins at conception. The Bible teaches that. Life is sacred. It begins at conception. We stand opposed to the silent holocaust that has taken place in our country since 1973. Legalized, legalized. During World War II, Nazi Germany, under the tyranny of Adolf Hitler, put to death six million Jews. Since 1973, we have put to death more than 62 million infants, preborn infants. But Bible-believing Christians are speaking out and taking a stand and have been for a while. Listen to this, folks. This is true. If white Christians had devoted the same energy toward protecting the rights of the newborn slave because of his or her value before God that they, that they have devoted toward protecting the unborn if white Christians had devoted the same energy toward protecting the rights of the newborn slave because of his or her value before God, the same energy that they have devoted toward protecting the unborn fetus today, the same energy, the church would have set a standard that most certainly would have changed race relations in America, even to this very day. So what's going on? The question is, what is going on in Genesis chapter 9? Yeah. The translation? No. No. Just a name. I don't know exactly what the Hebrew word means. You know, like, I don't know what Japheth means, and I don't know what... Well, it may, but what I'm going to show you is, what I'm going to show you is the text, it has no, the curse that Noah in his prophecy gave has nothing to do with Ham. It had to do with Canaan. It had nothing to do with Ham and the people that occupied this area here. It was here. The curse was on Canaan, not Ham. So that's a, I just, I just made that point because that's what I'm, that's what I'm, that's what I want you to see in the text. That's why the Bible says we're to do, we'll do what? We're to rightly divide the word of truth. We're to take the text seriously. So anyway, and, and not look for passages of scripture that go along with the culture and make them fit the culture. No, our under, the Bible is not, nothing but countercultural. And those that preach the gospel and those that stand for the truth, you know, we're countercultural, but we still have freedom to, to preach and teach the Bible. Okay, let's, uh, let's go on to this. So, look at that little box there. Um, what's going on here? Does this passage teach that black people were cursed by God to be slaves or that black people are inferior to white people? The answer is no. It does not. Absolutely not. Now, so what we need to see is we, first of all, we must set Genesis 9, 18 through 29 in a bigger context. There's a bigger context. So what do you mean? Well, We've got to include chapter 9, verse 18, through chapter 11, verse 9. Okay? 
And the theme of this bigger passage, the Tower of Babel, the dispersion of people on the earth, and as a result, because of genetics, the, the, the rise of you know, people, groups, and cultures, and different ways, different eye shapes, different, different, different shades of melanin. You know, we're all brown. You know that? We're just different shades of melanin, which is a brown pigment. We're all brown. We're just different shades. If you're white, you're in trouble. You're not well. You're probably in a room in a funeral home. <laughs> and they've removed. Uh, but anyway, you're not doing well. We're all brown. Just different shades. And uh, different types of hair and different type looks, different culture, different language. All that comes out of this passage of scripture, chapter 9, verse 18, through chapter 11, verse 9. All of it. That's why it's very important to understand this. Okay, so bigger context, and not only that, but these verses should be studied as a unit, but the theme, the theme of these, this section is man's dispersal and the rise of nations. The rise of the nations. And I don't mean political entities like the United States of America. How many people groups and ethnic groups are in the United States of America? All kinds of... There are 17,431 ethnic groups in the world. That comes from the Joshua Project. So we're not talking about political boundaries and, and political nations. We're talking about ethnoid people groups, cultures, languages, um, you know, all that type of stuff. So... The bigger context, Genesis 9, 18 through 11, 9, and the theme, man's dispersal and the rise of the nations. And here's an outline, simple outline. Chapter 9, verses 18 through 29, which is about the, pro the prophecy of man's dispersal. The prophecy. Noah gives a prophecy. Then chapter 10, all of chapter 10 is the table of nations. The completeness of man's dispersal. There it is. The beginnings of it. The, the uh, completeness of man's dispersal. And then chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. The mechanism for man's dispersal. And what was the mechanism? You know, chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. The Tower of Babel. Right? That what man was doing there and how God d divided them over the face of the earth. And because of genetics and people groups going off in their language groups, off developing their own cultures and intermarrying and the recessive genes rising to the surface because they're not part of one big pool anymore. We have all the various uh, cultures and looks and, but you know what? There's only one blood. There's one race. So, so we have the prophecy of man's dispersal, the completeness of man's dispersal, and the mechanism for or of man's dispersal, how God did it. He, he confounded their languages, and they couldn't communicate, so they went off. And there's some of the names, or the names that are mentioned in Genesis chapter 10. The descendants of Japheth are the goyim, the, the Gentiles, and they 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 are gonna they're gonna greatly increase, and they're probably the biggest group. There's the descendants of Shem or the Semites, and then there's the Hamites and um, the descendants of Ham. All right, so let's um. Let's get into this. Okay, the first thing, let's look, the first major, right in the middle of your page there, below the box, the prophecy of man's dispersal. The prophecy of it. Let's get into this. First thing I want you to notice is um, Noah's scattered family. 
Noah's scattered family. It says in chapter 9, verse 18, the sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now notice this. In parentheses, there's something that's inserted there. You better notice it because it's really important in understanding the text. It says, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. That's really important that that's being emphasized. Because as far as the Israelites and biblical history of the Old Testament, the Canaanites had a big part in Israel's demise. God gave to Israel the land of Canaan, didn't he? Right. And he told them to go in Joshua and to exterminate the people because they were wicked. Read Leviticus 26 and the things that the Canaanites did. The most dis uh, homosexuality, bestiality, sex with animals. Um, and God says, don't do what the Canaanites do. Okay? You need to eliminate them. But they didn't do it. And they became, they got integrated with the Canaanites, took their practices, intermarried with them. That was not good. So, Ham is the father of Canaan. That is pointed out for a reason. Okay, then it says, These were the three sons of Noah, and from them came the people who were scattered over the earth. From them, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, came the people that were scattered all over the earth to this very day. And then look at chapter 10, verse 32. At the end of the table of nations. Very last verse. These are the clans of Noah's sons, according to their lines of descent within their nations. From these, the nations spread out over the earth after the flood. All right. Noah's scattered family. Um, let me say a few things about this. Noah was to become the patriarch of a vast clan that would eventually branch out to form all the various tribes and nations and ethnoi of the earth. Just as Adam was the head of the human race in the beginning, Noah is now the head of the human race after the flood. Everything flows from him and through his three sons. It's a couple of things to notice. First of all, the concept of races needs to be abandoned. That is an evolutionary concept. And Christians ought not to speak of races. There are different cultures, but the concept of races is, is a terrible thing. And then secondly, the significant thing about Ham is that he is the father of Canaan. That is mentioned in chapter 9, verse 18, and then it's mentioned again. Look at verse 22 of chapter 9. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father's nakedness and told his two brothers outside. See how it emphasized the father of Canaan? For a reason. The Canaanites are the ones that are, are cursed here. Um, Ham is the father of Canaan, mentioned Twice, which of course prepares us for what follows in the Bible. The fact that Ham was the father of the Canaanites was a prime of prime significance and interest to Moses and to the Spirit of God in writing this. That's what's being pointed out. Um, God gave Abraham's descendants through Isaac and Jacob the land of Canaan as their inheritance. It was the Canaanites that opposed Israel's entry into the promised land. And it was the Canaanites that became such a stumbling block to the Israelites throughout Old Testament history. And so that is, that is what's being featured here. Okay, the second thing, Noah's sad failure. Now this is sad because Noah was a righteous man. But look at verse 20. Noah, a man of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard. When he, when he drank some of its wine, he became drunk and lay uncovered 
inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father's nakedness and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it across their shoulders. Then they walked in backward and covered their father's nakedness. Their faces were turned the other way so that they would not see their father's nakedness. And let's finish reading. When Noah wo awoke, notice this now, notice the words. When Noah awoke from his wine and found out what his youngest son had done to him. He said, cursed be Ham. Is that what he said? No. He said, cursed be Canaan. The lowest of slaves will he be to his brothers. He also said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. So something about Shem, the God of Shem. The Lord is the God of Shem. May Canaan be the slave of Shem. May God extend the territory of Japheth. Extend it. Um, into India and Europe, and it doesn't say that in the text, but the Western Hemisphere. This is the, this is, this is the goyim, the Gentiles of the earth. May God extend the territory of Japheth, and may Japheth live in the tents of Shem, share in the blessings of Shem in some, some, to some level. I think that's Genesis 12.3. Um, through you, all peoples of the earth will be blessed. And may Canaan be his slave. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. Altogether, Noah lived 950 years, and then he died. All right. Noah's sad failure. The text says that Noah drank wine and became drunk, and his drunken and in his drunken stupor exposed himself in a shameful way, much to the amusement of Ham. We don't know what went on between Ham and his drunken, naked father inside that tent. Some commentators have suggested that Ham performed some kind of homosexual act or sexual act on his father because of verse 24, when, which says, when he found out what his youngest son had done to him. The text doesn't really say, though, so we don't know for sure. But what is important, one of the things we can take from this, point B, is the relationship. This is applicational to us. You know, what's important is the relationship between wine, drunkenness, and shameful and moral behavior. That's why it's, a, that's why it's kind of wise to practice abstinence. Stay away from the stuff. It loosens your, your um, inhibitions. Um, and maybe not in you, but in your children. It's just bad deal. This is the first mention of wine in the Bible. And the first mention of wine in the Bible connects it with drunkenness and immodest behavior. Noah got drunk and then he got naked. And then wine brought to the surface the vile passions and lust that surged in the soul of his son Ham. The next mention of wine in the Bible is Genesis 19, 30 through 38. What's that about? Lot and his two girls in the cave. Remember that? Uh, uh, incest and they got him drunk. And he lost all his, you know, he just, just not in control of himself, but his passions were in control. And he fathered children through his girls. And the effects of wine are just disgusting. Both Noah and Lot, two dads, ruined their children as a result of wine. The Bible warns us about wine. 
just go to Proverbs 20, 21, 23, 31, warns us very severely about, about its effects and what will happen, what could well happen because of the effects it has on already sinners. They have enough control, problems with dealing with uh, chastity and, and, and proper behavior and, keep, uh, and putting a guard over ourselves. Wine just loosens us. C, the behavior of Shem and Japheth as well as that of Ham in this time of sudden family crisis provides the occasion for one of the most remarkable prophecies in the Bible. Okay, so point number three, what is Noah's significant prophecy in verse uh, 24 and following? What is it? Well, Noah woke from his drunken sleep and discovered what had happened, and with prophetic insight, he saw in a flash the far-reaching significance of his son's behavior and the spirit of prophecy descended on him. Ham's behavior brought down upon his head. Now listen to this. Ham's behavior brought down upon his head his father's silent disapproval and upon his youngest son's head a resounding curse. And the behavior of Shem and Japheth, who walked in backwards, brought their father's blessing. The first is the curse of Ham. Let's go, it's at the bottom of the page, the curse of Ham. I mean, no, I'm sorry, the curse of Canaan. <laughs> so now you've got to scratch that out. <laughs> the curse of Canaan, Ham's fourth son. Notice what the text says. It says in verse 25, cursed be Canaan. No, I want you to notice the chart up here. Yes, Ham did, father of Cush and Mitzrayim and Put, and the, and the, which eventually spread out to the African continent, but the land of Canaan is what's focused on, the youngest. And I'll get into that. In order to understand this prophecy, we have to understand, first of all, Point number one at the very bottom, we must understand the descendants of Ham, which we've already done. I, I've already got ahead of myself. We can jump ahead to the table of nations in chapter 10. Let's go over there. And um, the descendants of Ham are listed for us in verses 6 through 20. The sons of Ham, Cush, Mitzrayim, Put, and Canaan. Um, as I said, Ham had four sons after the Tower of Babel judgment. Most of the descendants of Ham migrated to and settled the North African continent. Cush, Upper Nile region, Ethiopia, Sudan, Put, Libya, and the coastal region. Mitzrayim, the lower region of the Nile, which is Egypt and the Delta area. But one son in particular, Canaan, settled the area that God gave to the Israelites descendants of Abraham through Isaac and Jacob. Um, and the key thought I want you to take away from this is Noah's prophecy cannot be used to justify the enslavements of blacks, the practice of racial segregation, or the hatred of racial prejudice. It can't, this passage has nothing to do with that. It was Canaan who was cursed, not Ham or his other three sons, Ham and his descendants were simply passed over by Noah and lacked a blessing. Um, by the way, it's interesting that the official Bible version of American fund fundamentalism for much of the 20th century was the Schofield Reference Bible, the 1909 edition. That was the original edition. And this curse of Ham doctrine was taught in the notes of the Bible. In the footnote explaining Genesis 9.25, uh, we read, quote, a prophetic declaration is made that from Ham will descend an inferior and servile posterity. Now, in the New Schofield Reference Bible 1967, the curse of Ham doctrine was rejected and the footnote explaining Genesis 9.25 was changed to, quote, 
a prophetic declaration is made that the descendants of Canaan, one of Ham's sons, will be servants to their brethren. Why was Canaan selected for a special curse? Listen to this, because Noah, under the inspiration of prophetic vision, saw all the coarseness, the coarseness and shamelessness of Ham and what he did being worked out fully in the vileness and filthiness of the Canaanite tribes of a future day. And that's why God told Abraham when you come, look, the, the um, wickedness of the Canaanites has not come to its fullness yet. But it did in the days of Joshua. And God said, God told Joshua to go in and, and wipe them out, the whole culture. Because Noah saw in the youngest boy, Canaan, all the crud and the shamelessness and the coarseness of Ham and what he did magnified in a greater way in his son, Canaan. Just read Leviticus 18 and, um, and what God describes about the Canaanites there. Don't do what the Canaanites do. And then number three, God's judgment on the Canaanites is spelled out. The lowest of slaves will he be. Okay? And that is why, that is why the subjugation, enslavement, and eventual extermination of the Canaanites began to be fulfilled when Israel occupied the promised land under Joshua. And... Uh, uh, point five, the curse has not, this curse has nothing to do with black people. It's a direct prophecy of judgment against the Canaanites who later occupied the promised land. And that is what was uppermost in the mind of Moses and of the Israelites in the Old Testament scriptures. Um, okay, what about the blessings of Shem, the blessing of Shem? It has two parts. Notice what it says. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. So the Lord in some way has a real particular relationship with Shem. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan be the slave of Shem. And by the way, they didn't wipe them out, but what did they do to the Canaanites? They enslaved them. They subjugated them, made them carry pots and do their work, and so they enslaved them. They weren't supposed to do that, but they did it. God told them to do more than that because they became a problem. Um, so first, the Lord was to be the God of Shem. The promise of spiritual salvation was concentrated in the descendants of Shem or the Semites. The Semitic peoples would be those through whom God would channel to men both his revelations, the Bible, the scriptures, Old and New Testament. The scriptures come from them. And his redemption, Jesus Christ. The son of David, the son of Abraham. And the second part of Noah's prophecy is that Canaan will be the slave of Shem. And as I said... The subjugation, enslavement, and ultimate annihilation of the Canaanites began to be fulfilled when Israel occupied Canaan under Joshua. And then the blessings of Japheth. The blessings of Japheth has three parts. May God extend the territory of Japheth. This enlargement refers to the great geographic and numerical increase of his descendants. Unless you're Semitic or no more Canaanites, so you're not one of those, or descendants of Ham, unless you're, you are a descendant of Japheth. If you're, you have a European background, I come from, I don't, but my mother was born in France, my dad's father was born in France in a different part, so I come from that area. But that's all that's all the Goyim, the Japhethites, the descendants of them. Same thing going east, going west, and then coming across the pond 
into where we're at here and into South America and so forth. This is, that's, uh, and China and all that, that's all the, the results of Japheth. That's what it means. May God extend the territory of Japheth. The Bible talks about the islands. That's what it's referring to. May Japheth live in the tents of Shem. That's an interesting phrase. Japheth will somehow share in Shem's blessings. Okay? Um, Noah prophesied that Japheth's descendants would come in a special way into the blessings of Shem. Genesis 12, 3. Through you, Abraham, all the families, the peoples of the earth will be blessed. And then, uh, lastly, may Canaan be his slave. The descendants of Japheth would also, in some way, participate in the subjugation, enslavement, and eventual extermination of the Canaanites. So, the bottom line is this. This passage is the basis, this passage is the basis of the curse of Ham doctrine that has caused great problems in our country. And um, it, it asserts that because Ham was the father of black people and because he and his descendants were cursed to be slaves because of his sin against Noah, Africans and their descendants are destined to be slaves and should submissively accept their status as slaves in fulfillment of biblical prophecy. The church preached that. The church condoned it and used this passage, and it's sad. It's a sad chapter in American history. And in some respects, we're reaping the results of sins of our fathers or carelessness, I don't know what you want to call it, of our fathers. But it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the Canaanites. Okay, let's go now to, I want to, I want to take my six minutes here. Let's go now to the completeness of man's dispersal. We're not going to spend a lot of time in chapter 10 because, because this is what chapter 10 is about. It's about the genealogy of the descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth and their children and then some of their grandchildren and some of their great-grandchildren as, as people spread out. And what caused them to spread out was the Tower of Babel. So really, chapter 10 comes after chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. 1 through 9 is the, is the catalyst. Because up until then, they were all gathered. They were all gathered on the plain of Shinar. See that right up there, that place? Up to that point, they were all gathered on the plain of Shinar right there. In Ur of the Chaldeans, right in the land between the rivers, right in here. That's, by the way, the cradle of civilization. They were all gathered there, but after the Tower of Babel, after God confounded the language, chapter 10 is the result of the dispersion of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, their children, their grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. Some of them. And it's pretty accurate, by the way. It should be. Okay, notice the completeness of man's dispersal. We have the survey of the table of nations, almost always listed as, they're almost always listed as Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Um, Shem receiving the priority. He's listed first. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. That's how they're always listed, except in chapter 10. Um, But in the table of nations, the order is oldest. Japheth was the oldest. Japheth was the oldest. We know that from chapter 10, verse 21. Then the youngest was Ham, chapter 9, verse 24. Then there was Shem, who was given the place of priority or prominence. Uh, and in the, in the list of chapter, table of nations, it's Japheth first, then Ham's descendants, then Shem. Because in being placed last, he's actually given a place of priority because that's, we go into the, we go into the genealogy of Shem down to Abraham and that, and that's, that's the line of priority as far as 
redemption is concerned, as far as the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15 is concerned. I hope that makes sense. Now, look at these things. The, the descendants of Japheth, the descendants of Ham, the descendants of Shem. There's an interesting part to this in um, chapter 10, verse 25. Look at 10.25. Everyone with me? About the sons were born to Eber. There was the sons of Shem, okay? And then there's the son, uh, sons of Aram. Then there's Arphaxad. I mean, there's Shem, then Arphaxad, and then Shelah, and then Heber. And then two sons were born to Heber. One was named Peleg, because in his time, the earth was divided. His brother was named Joktan. Now, isn't that interesting? His one son was named Peleg, which means division, because in his time, the earth was divided. What do you think that might be a reference to? Now, Babel, the Tower of Babel. That it was in his time that the earth was divided. People were driven apart. God told them to do that. But yeah, right here. Shem, Arphaxad, Selah, Heber, and Peleg, which means division because in his time the earth was divided. And that's what caused the table of nations. Okay, number two, lessons. What, what are some lessons from the table of nations? I want to give you four lessons, and we can only be really brief. First of all, maybe I should just say this. Well, anyway, I'll give them to you, and then we'll... All nations are of one blood. All nations are of one blood. Today there are there are today there are 7.84 billion people on the earth. But there's great diversity. Great diversity. The human race is diverse in geography, language, culture, skin color, physical capabilities, dress, habits, diet, and so on. I mean, there's there's just great diversity among the peoples of the earth. 17,000 431 people groups, ethnic groups, with cultures and languages and dialects and, uh, you know, uh, all those things. Habits, dress, all those things. But those differences, as real and profound as they really are, are not the final truth. The first lesson of Genesis 10 is that we're all members of the same family tree. Paul, speaking to the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers in Athens, in Acts chapter 17, said this, from one man, God made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. King James Version reads it this way, God has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. Every person is related to every other person on the earth. There's no such thing as American blood, French blood, Pakistani blood, Israeli blood, Finnish blood, Filipino blood, African blood, Caucasian blood. There is one blood. You know how you know that? You want proof? And then I'll close with this. The proof is this. Um, you can take... You can, if you are traveling in uh, China or you're traveling in India and you have an accident and you need blood, and your blood is what? What's a common blood type? Huh? A positive. And someone in India in a, f a blood bank has A positive blood, you can have a blood transfusion or get blood and, you, and your, your life will be saved. It doesn't matter who you get it from, as long as it's that type. No matter where, in any place, you're traveling, and you're traveling in uh, 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 um, Zambia, in Africa, and you have an, a problem, and you need blood, there could be a Zambian that has A positive blood or whatever, that has donated blood, 
and you can receive blood from that person because it's the same as yours and your life will be saved. Here's the reality of the thing. Between, between any people, any person on the whole earth, any person in any culture, any place, there, the, there's only a 0.2% difference between any two people. In other words, that means 99.8% of every human being on the earth is, is the same. 0.2% difference. And of that 0.2% difference that, that distinguishes people, um, of that 0.2% difference, I think I wrote this down there. Researchers tell us that human DNA is so stable that you can take two people from any place on the earth Compare their DNA, and it will be 99.8% identical. Furthermore, of the 0.2% difference, the visible characteristics, such as skin color, eye shape, and so on, the things we make such a big deal of, account for only 0.012% of the genetic difference. Of the two tenths, 0.012% is those, is those things we make such a big deal about. which means that the so-called racial differences, which seem so important to people, are trivial to the point of insignificance. When you look at people, whose eyeglass are you using? The eyeglass of an evolutionist or the eyeglass of the word of God? It's, it's like night and day stark contrast. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All nations are of one blood. Here's the other three, and then we'll be done. All nations have one problem. What's that problem? Sin. All nations have one Savior, right? Genesis 3.15, John 3.16, and all nations need one message. Paul says we've been given the message of reconciliation. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every living creature, or um, go and make disciples of all the ethnoi. So, that is our task. And then the mechanism of man's dispersal. We'll get into that next week. Let's pray. Thank you, our Father. We need to understand, we need to rightly divide the word of truth. We need to treat your word very carefully, and we need to not allow the culture to interpret the Bible or force us to make the Bible fit some cultural quirk that we want to accept. That's handling your word disrespectfully and dishonestly. And we need to be, we need to understand that, that your word is your word and it needs to be understood accurately so that we might live in a way that brings honor to you and have a biblical thought, thinking process, and a biblical mindset. Thank you for this great book of the Bible, which so desperately needs to be understood from the very beginning, Genesis 1-1. And we're thankful in Jesus' name, amen.